tonight uh, and being part of this. This is a huge deal going on in Milwaukee, a uh, potentially dramatic change that could really improve people's lives, and uh, being here and being part of it is a big deal. Uh, I'm Ted Craig, and I am active in Citizen Action's Organizing Cooperative. How many people know what the Organizing Cooperative is? Almost everybody does, so I will not bore you, but it's a grassroots organization um, that it works on all kinds of great things, especially health care, but also on climate. And uh, a year, year and a half ago, we came up with the idea of an economic and climate justice committee, because we see those two things as interlinked. And we became part of a coalition that we now call MECA, the Milwaukee Equity and Climate Alliance, with the Sierra Club and 350.org and NAACP and some other groups. And uh, decided, you know, we really wanted to push for a Green New Deal in Milwaukee, where uh, a major effort is made to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same time create economic opportunity for people who need it. So um, this forum uh, is uh, the second, actually, in a series of forums we're having about the Green New Deal in Milwaukee. First forum was in September and was about transit and transportation. It was a really good forum, great discussion that we had and learned a lot. Um, this forum is on um, uh, deindustrialization economic opportunity. We're going to have a forum also on December 3rd, so look for the emails and the notices, and we're still setting which topic that is. There's a lot of different things to cover, but hopefully we'll know really soon. Um, Forum at hand is about the New Deal part of the Green New Deal. Uh, you do, the New Deal, people may remember, came about at a time of economic catastrophe where people's livelihoods were very uncertain and suffering was extremely high um, and with unemployment and, and, and no investment and so on. And uh, fortunately, we had a president and a movement that was able to create massive investment in uh, the American people and in the future to help recover. And uh, we have a remarkably parallel situation for at least parts of our city. Uh, unemployment in the Great Depression topped out at about 25%. Uh, we have higher unemployment rates than that in African American communities all the time for decades, and very little has been done about it. And we have an urgent need to address climate, so the two go together very nicely. Uh, the upshot of our coalition coming together, which a number of people here were involved in, is that uh, we reached out, uh, especially with the assistance of County Board Supervisor um, Supreme Warren Lakunde. Uh, to both the city and the county about uh, developing a plan to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, fortunately, uh, by wide majorities, uh, really overwhelming votes, both the county board and the common council decided to form a task force with the charge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 45%. Um, so that's like the context, and that task force is going to be meeting on November 11th, actually, and getting going. And it'll be open meetings that people can attend. There are really two sort of twin uh, injustices in my mind that are being addressed here, two or three, depending on you count them. Uh, one is we've got a real intergenerational injustice going on with climate. It cannot be stated enough what the consequences are of our inaction on climate. Um, I recently read an article that the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere right now, which are you know about 410, 415 parts per million, pre-industrial was 280, they're already high enough that the last time we had these kinds of concentrations was three million years ago, long before modern day human beings existed. And at that time, the Earth was five degrees warmer and the oceans were 60 feet higher. Do you know what 60 feet higher means? These numbers, right, can make your eyes visible. It means there is no Miami, it means there is no Boston, there is no New Orleans, there is no Cairo, they're, they're gone, okay? And the uh, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people who live in these places, where are they gonna go? It's chaos, and this is, we already have that amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And if you read deeply into this enough, stuff enough, um, it's not an exaggeration to say that human existence is on the line. But extinction is a genuine possibility. We are changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere and the oceans to such a dramatic degree. So, so tremendous injustice we're doing to our children and grandchildren by taking, really doing nothing about this. Emissions globally are still increasing. Second injustice is uh, economic injustice. That we've had an economy that has basically almost all the benefits have gone to super rich people, and giant powerful organ corporations, and most people are lagging behind, and very little has been done to reverse that, especially I'm part of the union movement, and we've watched, we've just taken a beating, and very little has been done by the powers that be to help. The third injustice is racial injustice, um, where we have depression-like conditions with 50% unemployment for African-American men in like 53206 zip code, and people become complacent and very little is done about it, and uh, there's still lack of investment in areas where people really need it, and frankly, there's ongoing racial discrimination uh, that goes on every day. It's not just historic discrimination, it's ongoing discrimination. And so we have an opportunity through
this process to do something about all three of those things with this resolution, something serious in Milwaukee. Um, one, thing, uh, I, I, one thing that's really important to say, I don't know how much the panel will get into, but investments in energy efficiency and renewable energy, which are the lion's share of what we need to do about climate, and some other things like forestation and so on, and, and reforestation and so on, uh, have a massive potential to create jobs. For one thing, we need like trillions of dollars of investment to really actually make a difference and cut greenhouse gas emissions that we need to. We're talking about uh, absolutely New Deal level and World War II level investments where we need to transform our economies fundamentally. Trillions of dollars of investment means a lot of jobs. And if it's targeted right, it can mean economic opportunity for people who've been denied it, and it can mean good, well-paying jobs for people who get those jobs. Um, but there's a lot of research on what the job potential is in the Green New Deal investments, and I'm going to make it short because I'm already talking long, but if you haven't seen it, there's a report by COWS, used to be called the Center on Wisconsin Strategy, and they showed that um, Wisconsin is in what's called an energy deficit. We import the vast majority of energy that we use to run cars, make these lights on, you know, keep these buildings, and so on. It's to the tune of $14.4 billion dollars in deficit, where we're importing all this energy and spending money and sending it out of state. If we did Green New Deal type policies, right, to greatly reduce our energy expenditures and to transform the local renewable energy like wind and solar and other sources, it would create, according to Senator Wisconsin strategy, 162,000 jobs in Wisconsin. Um, a lot of great jobs. Green building um, construction managers, uh, ultra-efficient uh, HVAC jobs, weatherization, solar installation, design and maintenance, even things like tree planting and maintenance, there's just so many jobs that can be created that it could create real opportunity and investment in places that have not seen investment and opportunity in a long time. So uh, there's a tremendous opportunity here. Hopefully, we'll be able to take advantage of it. And I think our panelists will talk largely about the lack of opportunity and where that came from. The one other thing I would say is, does anybody know what the downside of the New Deal was? Or one of the downsides. I'm sure there was more than one. What is one of the big downsides of the New Deal? It wasn't uh, spread equally. Yep. Green New Deal did a heck of a lot better if you were a white person than it did for Hispanics, African Americans. Just remember the, the labor law. What's that? The New Deal, not the Green New Deal. Oh, what? did I say green? Yeah, we got to <laughs> Green New Deal is what happened. Right. New Deal. <laughs> but I mean, just look at the labor laws, right? Uh, the right to unionize came about in the New Deal era, right, with the Wagner Act. And uh, it excluded domestic workers who were the domestic workers. African Americans excluded farm workers who were the farm workers, Hispanics, right? And that was all very purposeful. And, you know, we have a chance to do it right this time, but it's going to take our being very focused on what we're trying to accomplish and make sure that this is done right and that it's real opportunity for everybody. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rafi, who's going to MC the panel here. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, I'm Raphael Smith. I'm the Civic Engagement Program Director at Citizen Action in Wisconsin. Um, this issue, I mean, uh, I was there for the transportation event, but this issue, de is an uh, issue that is at one of the things that pains me most about living in Milwaukee. Um, I was born and raised here. I am the third generation of black men to be born in Milwaukee. And my grandfather's generation, my grandfather, he worked at A.O. Smith. He worked at A.O. Smith for over 30 years, and he was able to retire with a pension, right? But my father was born in 1961. By the time he came of age, that reality of those good jobs were going by the wayside. And when uh, I was born in 85, by the time I was came of age, it, nothing exists. I just spent my time walking around the ruins of what used to be, going to barbershops and hell, talking about how great things used to be. And the Green New Deal for me is the opportunity to have a renaissance, to bring back those glory days. It's not gonna be perfect, it's not everything going to be the way it was in 1977. But this is a great start. It's a great opportunity to do something big and bold. Um, our panelists will be able to speak to it. Our first one is Earl Ingram, the real famous Earl Ingram. Um, Come on. Oh, you got to gas you up, man. Oh, you know what I mean? I got to <laughs> gas you up. Uh, from 1510, the radio <laughs> show from 68, 68, so 6 to 9, yes. Monday through Friday. And he's going to be able to talk to you a little bit more about the history of your decimalization in the city. Uh, first off, uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm honored to have the opportunity anytime anybody asks me to, to speak. I'm honored because um, really I'm, I'm amazed uh, that I'm getting these opportunities. So um, my name is Earl Ingram Jr. I am the seventh of a family of 13. 
Uh, my mom and dad raised 13 children. I was the one in the middle, the one that was forgotten, six younger, six older. You know the one when you sit down at the dinner table and they say, hey, one is missing. Who, 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 who is that one? Oh, him. <laughs> yeah, it's right in the middle. But I've got a, a wonderful story. Uh, my life story is, is an amazing thing. Uh, I'm 65 years old, so I'm on Medicare. How many folk in here know what that is? I, and enjoy it. And enjoy it. We're blessed to have it. I would have never thought that it would have come this fast, but it has. I used to think that was for old people. <laughs> and, and so, so anyway, people know me as a radio talk show host. I, that's, that's the life I live now. I've been married to the same woman for 41 years. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm a lucky, one of the luckiest men in the world. So I started at 18 years old. I graduated from Washington High School. I was scheduled to go to college at Stout University. Nine of my other siblings went on to college. My father worked at A.O. Smith. So one summer I decided to follow him uh, at, I graduated in 1972 in June. I said I was going to go out to A.O. Smith to work a few months and make some money, and my dad told me not to go out there because somehow he knew I would be there for 34 years. And so I walked into the plant at 18 years of age, and I came out 53 years old. Those opportunities existed back then. My dad worked at A.O. Smith, and he was able to support 13 children in a middle-class lifestyle where my mom stayed home and provided for us. You know, those of us who've been around a while remember those days. It was the reason why this city uh, had the highest standard of living for African Americans in the entire nation when I was a young man. You could do that. I went to A.L. Smith, I never will forget. I walked in that morning and I filled out the application and the man said, can you start tonight? Could have been Alan Bradley, Alex Summers, Slitz, Miller, Paps, Hannes Vega, Continental Can, American Can. It could have been the Drop Forges, it could have been the Tanneries, it could have been Seal Test, it could have been Wonder Bread, it could have been Geyser, it could have been Singer Sewing Machine. On and on and on. This was the industrial metropolis. And so I, I, I remember as a young man, as a young boy, the, the sidewalks, the streets, they were immaculate. The parks were immaculate. If there was one dandelion in, in a park, in all the county parks, you would be amazed. Milwaukee was that kind of a town. And... Even though nine of my siblings went on to college, I made more money than all of them except for my oldest brother who was the president of MATC. But all the others, I made more money with a high school diploma. And you didn't even have to have a high school diploma back in those days. My dad came here at the age of 18 and uh, from the north, from the south, because people knew the opportunities were here. Uh, basically had about a sixth grade education, uh, but he was able to build a reality, to build a family. That's what this country was, the opportunities that existed for everybody. And so that was the way it was. Um, went to high school, uh, was the first um, generation, not the first generation, but the first group to be bust. The civil rights struggle was going on. And, and the result of that, I went to an all black grade school. I li lived in an all black community and then the civil rights movement came through and I went to an all white uh, middle school and then basically all white high school. And I saw my whole life transformed. And I was able to see life through a different kind of prism. Today, uh, I work in the schools. I'm at a school where I see kids and um, 
young black children who basically don't have a snowball's chance in hell of making it in this society. And that's just one of many schools. There's 76,000 students in Milwaukee Public Schools. And I would venture to say 40,000 of them don't have a snowball's chance in hell of making it in the society. A lot of it has everything to do with why these companies were able to leave. A company uh, by itself can't leave unless there are laws that politicians put in place to make it possible for these corporations to leave. I never will forget the first time we started hearing inklings of something happening at A.O. Smith. We used to often sit around and talk about they could never leave because A.O. Smith was the machine shop of the world. We had more uh, punch presses than anywhere else in the entire world. So we would see all of this, and then we had some, especially that I worked on, that were you know, 50 feet above the ground, 50 feet beneath the ground, uh, maybe 400 to 500 inches long. We'd, we'd, we'd press half-inch steel. We had an amazing operation that appeared could never be moved. And then we started hearing inklings about uh, global um, globalism right in about the 1980s. Didn't know what that was. You know, America had been number one in everything. Think about it. Those of you who remember, America was self-contained. All the jobs were in America because we didn't need anyone else. We didn't need anyone else. Everything we needed, we produced here. The American people produced for Americans. We didn't have to deal with anyone anywhere else and didn't have to worry about those things. So that's why... We were able to make the kind of money we made. I made, I'm not saying this to brag. Trust me, I'm not. But in the 19, mid-1980s, I was making $80,000 a year with a high school diploma. There were guys who didn't have a diploma at all for making $100,000 a year at A.O. Smith, at Alan Brad, at Alex Jones. Great, great lives. We got to live middle class lifestyles. We got to buy homes. We got to take our kids on vacation, send our kids to college, do all the things that people who right now uh, would be considered upper middle, upper, lower, lower, uh, upper class with high school diplomas. Well, that was the good times. Those were great times. And what I never realized was, and I know I'll be done in quickly. What, what I never realized is I thought that that had happened forever. I thought that what I was doing had gone on for centuries. Even though the plan had been there for that long, the Industrial Revolution was but a blip. And we thought, because we were young, that it was not only uh, had been there for the, our, our period of time, but that it would go on forever. And when the realization came to us that this was all coming to an end, I started focusing and paying attention on why. Why has a plant that stood as long <coughs> as A.O. Smith, how could that happen that in the twinkling of an eye, it was gone. Well, politics made that possible. The companies, and they made us believe that the Japanese were taking our jobs. Japanese were taking the jobs, and so we became, we became angry at the Japanese. But what we didn't realize was our corporation decided to initially move down to Tennessee to get away from unions. There were no unions there. They began to move there. And after, you know, so they went from paying us $25 an hour to $12 an hour, no unions down in Tennessee. Well, then they thought, well, if we can do that for $12 an hour, 
Mexico's down there. So then they moved everything to Mexico. $12 was too much to pay. Then they moved everything to Mexico. And then Mexico became too expensive. They moved to Vietnam and India and China. What's happened to all of us is corporations have become more important than people. And, and so I don't know if we knew it, if we could have done anything to stop it, but it's what the issue and what the problem is today. Corporations have more power than the people. And unfortunately, politicians have made it possible for them to do it. They could not have done any of this unless politicians gave them the, the latitude to do that. Now, the community in which I live, in which I continue to live in, and will die in, I'm, I'm comfortable, I'm born in Milwaukee, I'm comfortable, I'm going to die here, and I'm all right with that. But I will never be comfortable with what has happened to my community. It's gone from one of the best places in the nation to live to one of the worst in, in half a century. And during my lifespan, and I'm not comfortable with that. I can't accept that. I saw this happen. And so every day, I try to get people to understand how this happened, how it occurred, and it can be fixed. But the only way you can fix it is to get elected officials to understand who they should be fighting for, right? They should, we elect them, we put them in office, and we don't focus and pay enough attention, except for my compadre here. <laughs> uh, but but we, we, don't, we don't put enough pressure on them to fight for us. And so we send them to office and we don't follow up on them and bring the pressure and the fear of God to them that you shouldn't be concerned about the lobbyists. Your focus and concern should be about the people who gave you the opportunity to sit down with the lobbyists. So I'm going to end it with this. I don't know how any of this is going to wind up. The ball has been kicked so far down the road that it's not going to be corrected in my lifetime, not from where we were, not from what I was able to experience as a young person. <laughs> Think about it. One job from 18 to 54, a pension, a livable pension that I get every month for the rest of my life, maximum Social Security, for the rest of my life. That was the rule. Now that's the exception. So that's the end of my sermon. Thank you for that. I just wanted to just bring into a vivid uh, view is, what was the timeline? It was what, over your lifetime? What, no, so, so 1972, I walked into A.O. Smith. And I came out of A.L. Smith in 2006. 35 years, you saw the rise and the fall of the industrialization in this city. That's correct. Powerful, powerful stuff. That's correct. Uh, our next speaker is Pepe Houlihan. Pepe Houlihan. I didn't mean to ask it with a question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is the conductor, signal, and educator for IAMAW Lodge 66 in Milwaukee and a longtime union and social justice activist. During the last 20 years, he has served as the president and reporting secretary a Milwaukee's chapter of the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, AFL-CIO. Pepe has experience working in workforce development throughout southeastern Wisconsin. Prior to his time in workforce development, he worked 18 years at Briggs & Stratton Corporation, where he lost his job due to the industrialization that occurred in 1999. Uh, Pepe, if you could tell your story and your testimony as well. Sure. Um well, first of all, I just want to say, you know, my name is, my nickname is Pepe, you know, my real name is Joseph Wilhand, um, 
And the reason that I picked up the nickname Pepe is that I was born in Mexico to North American parents. And when they brought me home from the hospital, all of my father's Mexican friends said, oh, that's Joseph. And any Joseph is a Jose, and any Jose is a Pepe. <laughs> normally, Latinos will tell you, you know, that if you know any Jose's, if you go to the house, you normally will, a lot of times you'll hear the family call him a Pepe, but they don't use it as a regular name. But for me, it stuck. I didn't know that my real name was Joseph until I was in Catholic school. <laughs> my first year in school, and they were teaching us to read our names, to write our names. And I was putting a P there, and the nun came up and slapped my hand. <laughs> Joseph is, you know, don't you understand who Joseph is? And I came home and asked my mother. I said, you know, my name's really not Pepe. And she said, no, it's Joseph. And I'm not your mother. <laughs> so, but anyway, I guess the, re the reason that I say that is I don't really feel, I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you some things that I've learned through the years and experiences that I've had um, dealing with the Latinx community um, and being a part of it. Um, but I don't want to pretend here that I can speak for the Latinx community in, in truth because I can drive to work. I go to work, you know, I work in Fond du Lac right now. I've been there for a while. I'm doing an assignment out there. And I can go to work every day and jump on the freeway and drive to work. And I know that I'm not going to get pulled over because I look like I might not be acceptable to the police and that there might be somebody that they could turn into ICE. I am not stopped at baseball games or in stores and told that I don't belong here, that I'm not really a true American, which many of my Latino, Latin, Latinx friends um, do. They suffer that. And if you're going to tell the story of the industrialization and the deindustrialization of this area and how it affected that community, you have to understand that because that is really it. So, but I do think that there's things that I can bring to this forum here, and, I, and I'm going to do that. And, you know, when Ted called me, I will do citizen action. I have a lot, a ton of respect for this organization, and I thought, of course, I'll come down and, and do what I can do to support this issue. So um, I did work, you know, prior to my work with the Workforce Development, um, with the Workforce Development Department. Um, I was 18 years at Briggs & Stratton, and I did watch. I was part. I was one of the people who lost their job. I didn't make it. I didn't make it through the hole that you, you, you got through. Looking. He yeah. got through, and I didn't make it. I had 18 years of seniority happy as I could be, um, really loved my job. I loved everything about it and felt like a, I felt like a whole human being. That's how I always say it. Before I got my job at Briggs, I was kind of a half of a human being struggling check to check. When I became, when I started working at Briggs, and the reason I did that, that that happened is because there was a union there and there was a contract and there was some protections and there was some rules and regulations about how they were going to, what they were going to do with people and how they're going to treat people. And that plays into this whole story a lot. I really believe it is. Um, but uh, the other thing I wanted to say before I get into more of, of this is when people say Latinx community, you know, you have to understand, and I hope everybody here does understand, it's a very, very broad group of different cultures, different backgrounds. It is not, there's no Latinx community just in and of itself. There's things that the Latinx community shares, but you can be from a lot of different places in the world. You can have a lot of different, um, cultural ba and your, your background and your, and your country of origin can be from a number of different places um, and still be under the umbrella of Latinx. And that's important for people to understand. Um, there's been Latinx worker or here, people here in the United States, or not in the United States, but here in Wisconsin, since before we were a state. So it's not, it, you know, just the immigrant Latinx workers are not the only Latinx people that live here, workers that have to, you know, try to make their way in this world. Um, but just in terms of some history, in the 1950s is when you saw a real big influx of Latinx workers into, the, into this, these areas. And it was mostly, at that time, it was mostly agricultural workers. Um, but a lot, you know, and some of them after it, 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 you know, stayed, some of them didn't, but there was, you did see the beginnings of a really very quite obvious community being built um, here. And um, then in the 1960s and 70s, you started to see the, that community move from more of an agricultural you know, more at you being, you know, doing the harvesting and stuff like that. Latinx workers started to settle here. They started to get jobs in the, in, in, uh, um, the industrial sector. They started to get jobs in um, different factories. Um, and you also saw at that time, because there was that opening and that, you know, in those days, that was when we were really booming here. You know, lots of jobs. You saw not just the Mexican agricultural workers, but you started to see people from Puerto Rico, from other Central American countries arrive, and they started to build the community the very strong, pretty sizable community that we now see. That's where we started to see that happen. 
And it's interesting to know that back in those days, um, you know, the same old thing that you hear so many times, which is so, you know, it's the, the modus, modus operandi of this country is that, you know, there are certain <coughs> occupations that are dirty and they're hard mm. and they're rough. And there's a lot, you know, it's not a very pleasurable occupation, but those are the ones that we're seeking. To this day, it's the same thing, you know. They're seeking, the Latinx uh, yeah. community is the one that they will draw on to try to, I mean, let's face it, to use people. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting in those times, back in, the, uh, in that time that I was talking about where there was this growth, foundries and tanneries actually hired recruiters to go down to Mexico and to Central America to recruit people to come up. And that actually, to be honest with you, it never really stopped. I, even in my lifetime, I remember working, we were working to organize a, a foundry on the south side, which was 90% Latinx workers there. And uh, we discovered that they had people, runners, who would go down to Mexico and they would find the families of the people that were working there and actually recruit them and, 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 and encourage them to come up because they knew that they could, you know, pay them very low wages, they could treat them the way they wanted to. Um, but, you know, uh, the same story that, that Earl just talked about is the same with the Latinx community in that there was a time in Milwaukee where you had your, you know, you had your, your, your Alice Chalmers, you had your factories that, that started to spawn good middle class livelihoods for people. And that's when you start to see the community, the Latinx community, start to grow also. Because, I mean, right now, when I, when I look around and I see the younger um, Latinx people that I know, professionals who have made it, so, so to speak, you know, they're now living upper middle class or middle class lives and they have professions, they've been to college. Ask them, what did your father do? What did your mother do? You know, what did they do? They worked in unionized factories in Milwaukee. It was Dale Smith, it was the Briggs and Stratton's, it was, you know, maybe not so much Briggs and Stratton, I don't remember a huge Latinx community there, but in other factories there were those jobs that were available to them that helped them to grow strong families and in turn make them you know, give it the American dream, which is that we're supposed to provide a better livelihood for our offspring than we have for ourselves. And uh, I know as a father and a grandfather, <clears throat> that concerns me greatly to, to, to think that maybe I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, uh, you know, okay, um, one of the things, too, that I think that needs to be said about the, you know, the, the, the many factories that existed at that time, you know, Briggs and Stratton had a plant right on 32nd and Center, and they had another one on 124th Street, and they had another one in West Dallas. You know, Alice Chalmers was right there. The, you know, A.O. Smith was right there. American Motors was right there. You didn't have to have a car, okay? You didn't have to have a car. You didn't have to move around to get to these jobs, and they paid well. That was extremely important. And when you see what we've done, you know, this isn't getting into the transportation issue, but, you know, we don't have that kind of transportation. In my work with the Department of Workforce Development, I find a lot of people, I mean, in the past... 20 years, nearly 15 years at least, that's a humongous issue. Not only do the factories that exist now, when that changed, not only do they pay less and you have to work more, you know, more hours and, and you have to work overtime and you have to maybe take two jobs to support yourself, but now you have to drive 30, 40, 50, 60 miles to your job and back. And that takes a big chunk out of your paycheck. You know, wear and tear on your car, all that. Plus, in the, you know, when you're talking about Latinx workers, you're literally talking about getting stopped all the time um, and, and being harassed by the police because it's just, it's like a game out there on the freeway when people are going to work and back. So that was, what, you know, those, that's one of the things too that I, that I think about when I think of those factories and how important they were to the community. Um, like I said then, I mean, and like you heard from Earl, then those jobs started to disappear. And what you ended up with, I mean, you had, um, when they did start to disappear, it seemed like I remember everyone telling me, well, don't worry, we're going to move to a service economy. Hmm. Well, what happened to the service economy? It didn't happen, you know, and what did happen was you've just got the service jobs that do exist are struggling through trying to unionize and trying to do stuff, but we haven't gotten to any point where service jobs are, are family-supporting jobs. They're not. And Latinx people, workers, have been in the service, quote-unquote, industry forever, forever. You know, I mean, look at any movies from the 40s or 50s. And it's, it's, it's African Americans and it's Latinxes that are doing all the work, and everybody else is sitting around drinking cocktails. Um, <laughs> and that hasn't changed that much. I mean, it really hasn't. So they've been there forever, but then that caused a lot of people to move over, take two janitor jobs now instead of my one factory job. Well, that's, that ruins not only the economy, but it ruins the family. 
because when you're putting in that many hours, when you're not able to be home, then you've got kids who are not being raised properly and it just continues to, to hurt the community totally. Um, these layoffs are still going on, to be honest with you. I mean, Joy Global, is, they've changed to another company name and they still employ a lot of people, but they suffered some pretty major layoffs and a lot of those people were Latinx workers. I know we, had, we were working on a, a group called the Latinos of Steel for a while with the steel workers, which was pretty successful for a while. And when I got into the, you know, get to know a lot of those workers there, it was amazing the Latinx, the amount of Latinx workers that worked at that company and then ended up losing their jobs and had to filter back into some kind of way of finding a way to make a living. Um, you got motor castings, which just recently, you know, went through some problems. And that was like, I believe it was at about 80%. Latinx workers. Those are workers that were in a union, got decent wages, um, decent benefits. And then there was Cargill, the meat, meat, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, Cargill meat solutions. Um, I was involved in that layoff in terms of trying to get people back on their feet. And we went in and serviced that layoff. And, uh, you know, the amount of workers that just took a real hit on there and just lost their decent paying jobs. It was amazing. And it, well, you can see it. It didn't, hasn't ended yet. That decay had still, is still on its way down. Um, You'll see, you know, you see a lot of this temporary agency stuff going on too. You know, that's had a lot to do with the decay. The temporary agencies came in and they started to realize, companies started to realize, oh, well, here's a great way. I can get my workers and have somebody check them out for me. And, you know, if I want to fire them, I just tell them goodbye and they're gone and they have to be very scared, very vulnerable. I don't have to pay them benefits. Tremendous amount, you know, this is an HR person's dream, you know, to have this kind of thing. But they played a, a big part in this decay that's taking place. Um, I just, I just think too, I'd like to, you know, what I've seen in the last 18 years working in workforce development and working with individual workers, um, I've seen a lot of this where I have to work two jobs or I got a job. Hey, I got a job. Yeah, great. Somebody I've been working with for months. And they say, I say, oh, great. Well, where is it? So and so place. How much do they pay? Well, you know, it's 11 bucks an hour, but they said there'll be a lot of overtime, you know. So you see that decay going on too. Um, this has become the norm now. You have to work overtime to make, to make money. The other thing, just as a sidebar, but that is important, is that I also see, you know, I had a, a worker come in last year, and he, he had gotten a job in a place, and I said, you know, how come you're not working today? And he said, oh, well, we're shut down. My department shut down because a dust collector blew up. Now, I remember in my day as a union rep, 30 years ago, we had eliminated that. That was like polio. You didn't have dust collectors right. blow up mm. because we had, for, we had forced companies to understand that you need to keep them clean. You need to regularly monitor them. And it was just an indication to me as what, to what you know, how far this decay has gone, you know. Um, so, you know, just the last thing that I wanted to, to talk about, I mean, is I did look up some studies just to see this, just to uh, kind, of, kind of prepare for this. And there's, there's just a recent study by, you know, Wisconsin Policy Forum that um, it, it showed that, the, that um, Latinx workers are lagging way far behind in the upper, well, the higher wage paying jobs now, um, which shows it's just there's a correlation between that. There's a correlation that, you know, these good paying jobs that, that, that were able to allow people to afford a better living for their kids is no longer there. It's not happening. And it's affecting the, Latino, the Latinx community tremendously. And then the other statistic that came out of that report that I think was even more important was that while manufacturing has really, really declined in Milwaukee quite a bit, um, in the Milwaukee area alone, in, from 2005 to 2017, there was 7,600 job, um, 7, jobs lost to manufacturing in that area, according to that study. But what's interesting is that there were 3,800 more Latinx workers in manufacturing. And so what you see is the same I mean, it's, it's like if you look at history and you see what's going on, you know, it's the ebb and the flow and the ebb and the flow and where there's this place where now there's lower paying jobs that are not very desirable, in comes the Latinx workers, you know, then they start drawing on the Latinx workers. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flow that has to stop. It's a slow, flow that has to, to, to it, it has to be curtailed. We keep, we fought and fought and fought for centuries to do this. You know, I mean, we've been out there trying, but I think that it absolutely has to stop in this day and age. And I look at this new Green New Deal, both on the federal level and on the local level that's coming out, state levels that are doing this. Every time I look at these, these proposals, I always see that there's a very strong component of that it will be equal employment. There'll be equal employment with opportunities. 
And I know there are opportunities because I've seen it. I mean, I've seen the solar panel, um, manuf in manufacturing solar panels, and that whole industry, the retrofitting industry, can provide tremendous manufacturing jobs. And then, I mean, in construction and installation, and those those opportunities are tremendous. And they not and the good thing about them too is a lot of those have like a pipeline you can move up. And I also think that you know this is a real chance. It's a chance for greater opportunities for people. It's a chance to reset the scale to some degree and say no, we're going to bring in this new this new model of, of, of economic growth for ourselves, which is clean, which is healthy, which is smart, which is the right thing to do, and put it on more of an equal basis. And I think it's also an opportunity to reset and recalibrate our relationship with, you know, when I say our, I mean unions, unions' relationship with communities like the Latinx community, because I don't think we've gotten off on a very good foot. I, I don't. I, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, it's, 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 not, um, it's not where it should be. Latinx workers, not all of them, of course, but there's many, many Latinx workers and people in the Latinx community would feel disassociated from the unions, and they don't understand the value of that. And I see these Green New Deals as a chance to reset that, to recalibrate that. I mean, in the construction field, a lot of times, contractors have used immigrant workers to, to fight the unions, and that's caused friction, and that's caused problems. We could possibly use this. If we're smart, we do this right. And I do see it in, this propo in these proposals, that it seems like that's at the basis, they all have that there, is to try to recalibrate that relationship because I think that's extremely important. They have to be, you have to have a union because you have to have some kind of control over what those employees are doing. Otherwise, it's just, you know, just the money wheel takes off and, and people get, get trod on. So um, I guess that's really all I have to say. The only last thing I'll leave you with is, I just got done reading the, the book Blowout by Rachel Maddow. I don't know if any of you have read it yet. But it's all about the oil and gas um, industry. And it's a really fascinating book. I thought it was really, she's, she's an amazing person. But the one thing that became very evident by reading that book is the oil and gas extraction um, industry is rife with, with corruption and rife with discrimination. They, discrimination is an integral part of their of their motive operandi, no one is that motive operandi, is it? Mm -hmm. They just, it's part of what they do. It's how they run their businesses. So I think that, you know, this, 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 these Green New Deals have to be pushed because they're good, they're good, they're healthy for us, but also because this industry has not been good for us. People talk about people on welfare. I hear that all the time. People on so called, you know, getting benefits supposedly, and they think they're living this life. You want to see a welfare recipient look at the oil and gas industry. <laughs> My God, you know, just take a look at that, you know. So they're not good for anybody. If they're not good for the environment, they're not good for the way they operate, and they're not good for the geopolitical situation that we're finding ourselves in due to their influence. So uh, I'm sorry if I went a little bit too long. That's there, all right. Thank you all very much for having me. Thank you, Pepe. <laughs> One of my fathers that you spoke to was a generational building, was my father worked at a factory and then I can move in the middle class because he can afford to pay for my college and I can move up. <laughs> this opportunity doesn't really exist anymore no. unless we do something big and bold around That's a brand right. new deal. Right. Uh, last but not least is Brother Supreme Moore Omokunde. Um, Supreme Moore Omokunde was born at home on August 27, 1979. Had a traditional African welcoming ceremony 11 days later. He's a part of the, the River West, I mean, Riverside uh, uh, collection of folks who are in River West and are in government. And uh, UWM, he studied political science. He has a strong commitment to social justice, and he is currently the Milwaukee County Supervisor representing District 10. Brother Supreme, you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, West African tradition states that I have to ask the elder for permission to speak. So, Brother Earl, may I speak, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So, um, a couple of things that I want to talk about first and foremost. Um, I just turned 40 two months ago. And so, uh, um, it's I'm gonna, happening. I'm going to tell you about the. It's uh, happening. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, I think I, my knee was sore for like three days. <laughs> My knee was sore for three days after that, and I was like, I, I didn't even do anything with this. Um, so, but I'm going to tell you about the perspective of a younger person um, coming up in uh, in this city. So, first and foremost, my my grandfather, um, my mother's father. Uh, my mother is the eighth of nine children, and my grandfather worked at J.I. Case. Tell them who your mother is. Oh, 
She's just a woman that gave. Yeah. Me. Okay. Oh. <laughs> My mother, for those who don't know, represents uh, the city of Milwaukee in Congress, Gwen Moore. Um, she's the eighth. She's the eighth of nine children to um, uh, Cora, Sophie, Cora, no, Cora, Lee Daly McKinney. Wow, that's my grandmother's uh, name, and and Jesse B Moore. Um, and my grandfather, Jesse B. Moore, worked um, at J.I. Case, and he poured steel um, there. He was a member of UAW. Um, he would warn my mother not to depend on some sweet man to sweep her off her feet and that jobs like his would not be available. He had a third grade education. He's from mm. Mississippi. Um, and he moved up. Um, his brother, my Uncle Buddy, moved up here first. And then um, he said, yo, there are jobs up here in Racine. Um, follow me. So, so he did. Um, there's a very interesting story about how my grandparents got together um, that I'll tell some other time over the beverages now, one day. Um, but uh, he warned my mother. He said, jobs like these won't be around forever. So you have to get something else because he lived a middle class life too, had a third grade education working for J.I. Case and uh, Racine. And, um, you know, he just said... Uh, that wasn't gonna, you know, boys gonna be around very long. But um, the way I grew up, um, I I went to Montessori school. I went to McDowell Montessori school when it was on Highland. It's now Highland Community School, and uh, um, I thought my teachers were very eccentric. Turns out there were most of them were hippies, um, and um, and so they I they laugh. they, <laughs> they led protests, and um, we had an organization called SOE which stood for Save Our Earth. And I remember drawing a, 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 a picture of like fast food and um, the, we had a phrase stamp out styrofoam. And, um, we, we collected glass on, we cleaned the glass on the, uh, the playground and we made a, a glass mural of a tree growing out of the ground, out of the white and the green and the brown glass that we cleaned up off the, off the ground. We had, um, we were celebrating Earth Day before it was a thing um, <coughs> everywhere. Um, we were planting trees and going to Aud Slitch Audubon Nature Center. I loved it. I hated, we, when they said we had a field trip, I hated going to like the museum. Well, the museum was cool. No, I won't say that. I didn't like going to plays or downtown. When I found out we weren't going to somewhere where we were tracking wolves tracks or you know tapping trees for maple syrup, I'd be like, oh, it's not a dirt trip. Um, and so I really liked those dirt trips where they would take us out in nature, et cetera. And so, um, so I was very aware of that. And also, my mom, we would be somewhere, and if I had a plastic or, or a can, um, and I had finished my soda, whatever it was, she would make me carry that plastic bottle or that can around with me all day until we got to the recycling plant because you didn't just have bins in your backyard like we do now. So I would have to take I would have to hold on to that all day long until we got to some place that we could recycle. I thought, I'm gonna just throw it in the garbage. No, no, no. Don't throw it in the garbage. Um, I think she makes her staff people do that now. <laughs> um, and so um, so in nineteen eighty five something happened. A lot of people call it the crack era. When, when crack cocaine hit a uh, major American city and, and started, you know, really uh, taking people to prison um, and taking um, people started getting addicted, losing jobs, um, getting really addicted, selling, you know, just using all their money just to get high. The phrase is the crack area. I call it the deindustrialization, Reaganomics, Cold War, mass incarceration era because. That's, you know, crack cocaine was, uh, the selling of crack replaced those jobs that people had yeah. in a lot of communities. Um, if you were making good money like Brother Earl and Pepe were, um, if you were making those jobs, you weren't selling crack in, in your area because the risk was too high. I used to mentor young people and they would, I would t we would talk about job readiness and they would say, I don't care about that because I'm just going to sell that hard white stuff yeah. and I'm going to get paid. And I would say to them, okay, cool. Well, let's figure this out. 
So do you know geometry? Can you measure? Do you know? Because you have to make crack. You can't just, it doesn't just come. You have to buy cocaine, which is illegal. So if you get caught, you're risking prison or being killed. You have to buy cocaine. You have to use baking soda with it. You have to cook it. And you have to, and it comes, then it comes in rocks. Then you have to cut it right and don't cut it too big because then your product won't, you know, won't be able to sell as, to as many people. Then you have, you have to realize that all the money you get, you're probably going to get arrested or killed or anything like that. So you have to figure these things out. By the time we ended our conversation, they just wanted to work at McDonald's. But, so <laughs> this, this is what would happen. But uh, so th those are the errors. That's the era that I grew in. And, and People blamed crack. Oh, crack ruined everything. Crack ruined everything. There was a huge machine that Reagan, you know, was the benefactor of, but it really started with President Nixon, for those who are, who are familiar with that. He had this huge machine called the War on Drugs, and they sat, after Nixon was elected, they sat in the Oval Office and said, how are we going to implement this stuff on crime thing that we just <coughs> ran on? And somebody mentioned, you probably know the names, well, there's always drugs, and it was like, great. So they built this huge machine, but they didn't have anything to point it at. But then crack cocaine came out. They said, here it is. Let's point our machine at that. And so um, that's why I, I, I label that era that because you had deindustrialization and you had the Cold War. We were fighting against, we were doing this arms war with Russia. So all of our resources, all of our community centers, our after school programs, mm -hmm. all the funding for these things went to fighting the Cold War. So then if I go to, to play stickball at my local NPS rec center, the funding for that is cut because it needs to go. It was federal funding, and it now needs to go to buy more um, weapons to fight Russia. We're, ne we're never going to use them. I just want to have more than they have. Um, and so, so those are the things that, I wanna, that, were, that were happening. Also, Reaganomics and him determining, yeah, we're going to cut the fat. We're going to cut government. But cutting government meant... Me, as a young black man that lived in the inner city of Milwaukee, got less, got less resources. And so that was cutting government. That's what we were going to do. And so um, that's what happened. And then all of the black men around me are losing jobs through, through deindustrialization. And they were making good money and being able to live, if they wanted to, out in Mequon. Or being able to buy their kids a brand new Wilson or Spalding basketball for their birthday. And... Um, you go to the court, and if you lose the game, you probably get your ball taken. Um, you know, but but you were able to have that, and so you know, that's the kind of times that we were growing up in. But I also also had this great, like I said, hippie upbringing where um, I ate rhubarb pie, and I thought it was good. And then my friends in my neighborhood was like, "You eat what?" <laughs> um, but I but I enjoyed it. Like you know, I, I learned about. Uh, you know, Maria Montessori was basically a saint um, in my classroom. And, we, you know, we learned about, we learned, we learned how to multiply on the abacus, you know. Um, and so I had that great experience as well. So when we met with um, myself and members of, of, the, of Mecca and um, <coughs> the, the president of the Common Council met to talk about um, climate and jobs. Uh, it was it was great. It was like a match made in heaven because I had um, taken my own path with uh, uh, climate change or anti climate change. There was this book that I read a few years ago called the Green you know, called the Green Collar Economy by Van Jones. And I was reading it. You know, I just I met Van Jones. Thought it was cool. And I, with this Green Collar Economy, he talked about. Um, how, you know, he talked about what happened with Hurricane Katrina and how that could have been, you know, prevented. Um, he talked about the types of jobs that we could have. If, if you think about the fact that there are uh, storage units for, for uh, solar panels, if you have a solar panel on your, on your house, you have a storage unit that you store the le electricity during the day so that you can use it at night. You also have a solar powered water heater in your house mm. that that also powers um, and the fact that we're creating these items um, and, and and building these and we can also uh, uh, go to our homes and insulate them better. Um, someone introduced me to this concept it's called the, the thermal envelope. If you go to communities, especially in urban areas, and you go in the wintertime after it's just snowed and you look at the houses, the ones that have snow on the roof are usually abandoned. They're empty. 
because the ones that have no snow on the roof, they have, they're using their heat and the heat is escaping through the roof. And so it's melting the roof off, the, it's melting the snow off the top of the roof. And so if we insulate properly and use funds or whatever we need from the city in order to, to properly insulate uh, these homes, those are jobs, are long-term jobs, because people will always need their homes insulated. Uh, people will always uh, need to build these, um, uh, 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 these generating, or the not generators, but these storage units. People always need to build these uh, places where they go to plug their cars in if you have an electric, an electric car. There's always an opportunity in the supply chain uh, business for uh, uh, new products as well, as, as well. So I wanted to, so that's one of the things that I really got interested in reading the green collar economy, retrofitting of roofs, windows, um, solar powered water heaters, and other things of that nature that are all things that were happening. This is like 10, 13 years ago, but we still, there are even more technology for it now that we can, we can deal with. I know that I think Green New Deal is a proper phrasing because we all know that the New Deal um, was a response to the Great Depression, which, as Ted stated, um, unemployment was at 25%. Um, and we thought that was crisis. In African-American communities amongst black men, it's like 60. And so I'm glad that we have a group of people who are responding to this as a crisis in the way that they should, because if it was white men, we'd have turned the city and the state and the country upside down already, and which we did with the New Deal. Um, but we just <laughs> looked to seek to, um, to undergird, as Dr. King says, to undergird our, um, our white peasants with their own government program. Um, but also, having these jobs available um, for black and brown men and women also changes the context of how we as black men look at our employment within the city. Because if we're going to talk about another aspect of employment, we've got to talk about tech and IT mm -hmm. as well and how that fits into um, the green economy. Um, because right now, you know, I remember the Notorious B.I.G. had this song called Things Done Changed. He said, where I'm from, you either sling rock or you had a wicked jump shot. Mm -hmm. And those were your two ways out of your neighborhood. Um, and so, um, personally, um, I have a lot of friends who there's this phrase called jumping off the porch where you're on the porch and when you jump off the porch, you're in the streets. And I have a, I saw a lot of the things happen. I grew up on 25th Street between McKinley and Juneau, which is not that far from here. And uh, my mother represented this area in the state assembly. And I used to walk by here all the time to go to Market High School College Prep. And so what would happen is I would see all of my friends who were selling drugs, paying their rent when the, when the landlord came to the house. And um, I knew I couldn't sell crack because there was an individual who was, present, who was preventing me from jumping off the porch. And that was my dad, um, Taloko Nombukunde. And he sat at the bottom of the steps and he said, jump off this porch if you want to. You still gonna have to see me in these streets at some point. Mm. And can none of these dudes out here whoop me. So you can either fight them in the streets and then fight me or he said, you can either fight me or them. None of them can whoop me. And he actually showed me. I won't talk about that in detail. But he actually <laughs> showed me, like one of the dudes who thought he was the roughest dude at, in the Hillside Projects. My father showed me that that dude couldn't whoop my father. So if I was going to roll with him, that, that I was going to have to see my dad at some point anyway. And so, so I couldn't sell crack, right? And so that was not an option for me. And I love baseball. I played baseball. I was pretty good at football. A friend of mine told me, he said, if you practice really hard every day, real, real hard in about five years, then you would suck at basketball. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I couldn't hoop. So I, that was not a way out for me either. So I had to find something else. And so there are a lot of our young men who were have to use what it is that they have other than, you know, sling a rock or, or having a wicked jump shot in order to do that. And so we need opportunities. Um, and so when we, when we talk about what this can do for black and brown folks who are going to live here, who are going to raise families here, because even during the Great Depression, 
you had a lot of baby boomers who were born during that time. So people didn't have money, but they kept making babies. Um, and so we're going to continue to have families and have children. We have to have ways in order to take care of them. And then we have hyper-segregation in the city of Milwaukee as well. So it can't just be, okay, we'll undergird white folks over here and we'll help them. We also have to help black folks and then black and brown folks and then have them determine where it is that they want to live. Allow them to continue living where they live. We can't say, oh, well, where you live now is now popular for us. And we don't want you to live there anymore. So we're going to move you away, take away public uh, transportation, and we're going to take away opportunities for you. We're just going to put you out somewhere, and then we're going to come and enjoy these new accoutrements that we have in the area that we used to think was so horrible. Um, and so we're going to continue to be here. We aren't going anywhere. So we have to be a part of, you know, recreating, you know, the Green New Deal that also includes everybody. Um, and I'm really uh, proud to be a part of this work. Um, so, so, so when I uh, got an opportunity to be a part of it, uh, I went to the ethics board to make sure I could do it and, and everything like that because I wanted to be a part of it because uh, I think Earl, Earl Ingram said it best. He said, um, when you have politicians who go to, um, who they, they go to the lobbyists or they go to whoever and they try to convince them. I know that I myself, I have to be very intentional about making sure I stay connected to the community and to my people. Because if you don't, there's always these elements that are, that are trying to pull you away from your people. Even if you have the best intentions, there's always elements that say, well, this is you now, and this is them. And you represent them, but say you represent them, but only do it in a very superficial, cosmetic manner. Um, it's very important to stay connected to your community, uh, the people you represent, and the issues that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Because it's easy just to isolate yourself and say, well, I have privilege now. I'm an elected official. I have my new suit on, and, and I can just go and rant and rave, and I have a platform to talk about what I want to talk about. However, we have to stay connected to the issues that affect people every day. And when I think about climate change, I think about folks in Bahamas. I think about folks in Puerto Rico. I think about folks in, uh, in New Orleans and with hurricanes and, and the increasing power of hurricanes because we have nuclear sites that dump warm water into Gulf streams. And that fuels hurricanes and makes them that much more uh, stronger. And so I don't think that climate change is a white issue because I see a lot of black and brown folks who are getting killed from stronger hurricanes and stronger natural disasters um, because that we're warming the planet. And so that's all I got to say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I didn't mention this in the introduction, but it was Supreme Moore and County uh, Common Council President uh, Shanti Hamilton leadership that made the Green New Deal task force a reality. It was those two who decided to make it a joint city county task force. So, thank you for your leadership. How much time do we got? Uh, well, minutes. I feel okay. Yeah. So, do we have time for a Q and A? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you have a question, let's uh, let's hear it. I saw a halfway hand raise, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, I've heard a few mentions about um, housing, about transportation, about solar energy. Uh, I'm just thinking, you know, the new deal is kind of an intersectoral uh, uh, issue. I'm learning how the joint task force has worked across sectors. We got a lot of experts on the task force, and. Um, from different all walks of life. People who've been doing this longer than I've, I've been alive. And so personally, I'm gonna yield to some of those folks to tell us how we should do things. But I think specifically around, um, there's like some wild ideas about how to do housing and building these like bio domes over houses or other folks who want to, um, when they look at removing lead laterals and doing it in a, in a uh, economically, economically safe way, but to also to, to protect our economy as well. Um, when we talk about transportation, I know at Milwaukee County, we have a pilot program for electric buses, which um, we kind of got to make sure we're doing it right because some of them don't work in very cold weather or very warm weather. We can experience both here. We kind of have to do that part uh, properly. Um, there's going to be a lot of things, things that I'm not even thinking about that are going to come out of the task force as well. Um, but it has to be something that is tangible for people who 
live in our communities. Um, um, some people may say, yeah, let's just invent a huge napkin to clean up oil spills. Okay. I mean, how is it practical for, how are the things that we want to do practical? And also, how are we connecting with the Green New Deal nationally? Because what the Green New Deal nationally does that um, the AOC and others developed is that it looks to local governments to do some of the groundwork and to do to get, put their hands in, and it requires that partnership. And so I'm interested in making sure that we are a proper partner. Um, uh, an intercity discussion for the metropolitan cities. Something like a regional mm -hmm. transit authority? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll bring that topic up for the 100,000th <laughs> 100, time. Um, I think that... Uh, when we lost Talgo, we lost another opportunity to have that conversation. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll bring it up again, however, when we look at, this is the thing, when it comes to like a light rail, high speed rail, and more um, efficient travel, that's better for you know your pockets and, and <coughs> the, the economy as a whole. Um, these things are gonna happen. They're gonna build light rail all the way around us. We're just not going to be. A, we're just going to have to get in on it on the last part when we could have got in on the front end and been a part of that. So it's going to happen. So the thing is, how do we participate in it when it's our time? Yes. To answer your question, I think um, we do fear that other people are, are better organized and have other agendas than we do here. But also, um, people are fed this um, perspective that. Um, you're in the suburbs or you're in rural areas and you're in the city areas and you're so different that you don't want to be around one another. And uh, so we, we've created that rural urban divide, the suburban urban divide. And it's like those people in those urban areas, you don't want to be around them. And also we have this concern that, um, and I think for a lot of valid reasons where if I go out to a suburban area that I'm, you know, I'm not going to be received well. And so do I want to be out there? And then also, um, this happened when Governor Walker turned his back on his his folks um, when he when he turned it, when he uh, took a different perspective on prevailing wage. Um, what he said was, "Okay, you don't need prevailing wage to build highways, to build freeways, etc." Um, um, the, the 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 former perspective that he had was. Let's take all the public transit money and put it in the freeways. That way, the people who are, are my people can get back and forth on roads, and then the people who build them can get paid. Then he turned his back on those folks and then took away prevailing wage. And that's one of the reasons that he lost it. So, so let, me, let me ask the audience a question, because I, I have to honestly say that I am woefully uninformed about the Green New Deal. How many of you are like I am, woefully uninformed, and how many of your friends are even more woefully uninformed? And, and so because of what I've just heard here, it makes me realize that for a guy who has a platform six days a week, I better hurry up and get busy having you guys on to get the information out. Um, because what's the purpose of it? You know, to hear this, you know, and I've read some things, but I'm thinking pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. But but based on when I, especially when when I hear Ted and the depth of his knowledge on it, and others, I mean, we just got to get you in, and however many times we need to do it and slug away to get the average person up to speed on just what it is we're talking about. It's like, well, we have to prioritize and like that and work on the small things and like that. Like if you, you know, you want to clean your house, it's a huge thing. So you took a little bit of time and eventually it gets done. But, you Thanks know, if you've got too many things that you're working on, <laughs> right. they don't get the full power of it. And it doesn't get done. It's just little splits here and here and like that. And then everyone goes, well, it's so big deal. Nothing's being done. But if you, you know, prioritize what's most important and work on that, and then people see, wow, then you're going to get more buy-in. Yeah. Let me get, oh, it's been a lot of guys talking, so let me get Janet in, and I got you next. Uh, this is just 
a response to what um, you were saying, though, um, you know, the task force that's been referenced here is going to meet for the first time on November the 11th, and it's going to be meeting in over six months to, um, and at the end, the goal is to deliver recommendations for the steps that Milwaukee should be taking um, to, to create and implement the Green New Deal. So it'd be great if there were a way to use the platform of your show. The, that's for, done. For regular updates. That's done. Because, and not just to educate people, but also the task force would want to incorporate, you know, input from the community. It's so, done. So that would be great. Okay, and the other thing we can do, and, I, and I'll say it, Ted, we can we can put a platform together out in the community yes. and use the radio station and my program to do that. So I'm willing to do all those things. Thank you. And Janet, she's not an organizer, but she's playing with an ass. She jumped at the opportunity. That's an organizer right there. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave. I want to encourage anybody here who wants to be part of the Citizen Action team, the climate justice team, uh -huh. please join us. I mean, um, uh, we can always use more people, and um, we'd be really happy to have anybody here to work with you. So, if you are interested, go to Dave and Chris at the table and have them put a star by your name, and we have an organizer or someone from the Climate Action team get back with you, all right? Yeah, that gentleman there had something. Yeah. You know, there, there, are, there are simple things we can do in our homes and in the community mm -hmm. that, that won't save the whole world, but it's a start. You know, and it gets people involved, it's got me involved, or just thinking about different things that we have to do. So anybody who knows me, number one, I'm a member of Citizen Action. And I forgot to tell you that. But as Ted well knows, it's not my program. It is the community's program. Mm -hmm. And so it's about getting information to the people. It's not about me. And because of what I've heard tonight, I, man, I'm, well, I'm ready. Okay, Ted, you know. And so however much time it takes, I'm on the air 18 hours a week. And however, you know, much time it takes for us to get the message out, that's what we'll do. I don't have any impediments. I'm free to do whatever it is I want to do with my program. And, and it's always about getting information to the people. So I already see guests that we're going to have on as soon as they're available, including if you're available to do something this Saturday. We can, we can begin this Saturday. If you guys have some time to begin building what it is we need to build. And, and for m most of you who may not know, the radio station is heard throughout Madison. We've got two radio stations in Madison. We're about <coughs> to put a powerful FM up in this city in the next week or so, which will give us a wide swath of listening audience in, in this state. And so that's what we'll do. Uh, man, I'm, I'm really excited about what I've heard here. And pe other people need to hear this message. Any more questions? So one question for the panelists and anyone else who cares to answer. Um, when, when a whole lot of money is going to get spent, hopefully it will, right, invested uh, to avert a climate catastrophe, a lot of times it does not go to the communities that have been most desperate that we've been talking about tonight. If you had just like 30 seconds to say what is the best way to make sure that uh, the money is spent and equal opportunities provided, what would you, what would you say? Great question. Make sure the people are educated to know it's there. Right. That's number one. So you can't fight something you don't even know about. Uh, and that's the way I see it. I'm on a new mission now. I, th I think it's important to invest in people. I don't even like the word empowerment because it implies that you didn't have power before somebody else showed up. However, um, invest in people self-empowerment um, through education, through cooperative businesses, cooperative living, um, all types of ways in which um, people can keep more of their uh, money, resources, intellectual property, etc. There's an organization called Cooperation Jackson down in Jackson, Mississippi is doing some amazing things around eco-socialism, what they call it, but it's actually like trying to build a city or I think re 
rethink of how a city can not only be eco-friendly, but also work for the people. So if you're interested in that type of work, Cooperation Jackson is an amazing organization doing some amazing things now. So I would say that it has to do with organizing. I mean, organizing is the, the, the <coughs> beginning and the end of this. You know, I think, you know, some of the stuff like what AOC, look at the impact that she's had, you know. That doesn't just come because she stepped out of nowhere. She did a tremendous amount of organizing in her area, and she was able to get herself in a position where she could be a spokesperson that moves this ball way ahead. And I think also just along the education front, you know, it's, it's about saving the environment and seeing what we individually can do to do more, you know, environmentally friendly things. But I think you have to look at the gas and oil industry. You have to look at the extraction industry. You have to make a clear understanding to everyone. What they, I mean, it, it, it's, it's amazing. These guys are at the core of our geopolitical life and many, many other countries. And the power is, you know, there's a reason that they're talking about protecting the oil over in Syria. Yeah. There's a re it's, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. And I think that we're not educated enough on that. Right. I think the average person doesn't realize how impactful the oil and gas industry has been on all of our lives and is, and that it's like a, it's basically like this monster that's, that's loose and it's, it's not going to be an easy one to stop. You know, this is not something that, you know, you talk about groups that are well organized and are fighting for whatever their agenda is. That's nothing compared to what the gas and oil. And right now what you're getting is TV commercials saying, gosh, if the plant could be like the plant, then, you know, BP's doing so much for it. No, you know, we have to have something to counter that. We have to have something that brings out the reality and the facts of what we've been up against for, for since the get-go, since the beginning of, of, of our country and the beginning of industrialization you know, and where it's gotten to at this point. And you know, and us baby boomers have to realize we owe something to the future. We've been blessed. We've been able to live in this country and not face what our grandchildren and great-grandchildren are gonna be faced with. We've gotta get our generation to understand this is our fight too. For them, for our future, and that's how it's got to be framed for our generation to understand this is not a fight just uh, for millennials and young. This is our fight to do as the Native Americans believed. Make sure that the land that you dealt with is in better shape once you leave it. That's what we have to do.